Iraq and Iran. Several people are reported to have been killed in Sierra Leone after police opened fire on anti-government protesters in the capital, Freetown. Police officers are said to be among the dead. The protests are against the rising cost of living, corruption and police brutality. The government has declared a nationwide curfew in an effort to stem the violence. Umaru Fofana is in Freetown. There are protests in the east end of Freetown and in many northern towns and cities, areas that are opposition strongholds. These people turned out and uh, they were chanting, saying that they wanted peace and that murder must go. Mada Julius Madabio, the president of Sierra Leone. I went to the east end of Freetown and I saw a lot of them, pockets of them in various areas, but quite a sizable number of them. And they set up roadblocks, burning tires, and the police responded. And I also have seen videos on social media from areas in the north, in McKinney, where large crowds also turned out there. And clearly, they've been running amok with the police all day today. The powerful Iraqi cleric Muqtada al-Sadr has further increased pressure on his political rivals by calling for parliament's dissolution by the end of the week. Hundreds of supporters of the Shia Muslim leader have been continuing a sit-in outside parliament after they stormed the building at the end of July. Al-Sadr said dissolving parliament would allow a date for early elections to be set. Police in Bangladesh say two leaders of the Rohingya community have been shot dead in a refugee camp at Cox's Bazaar. The incident is the latest in a series of killings in the camps. They're home to nearly one million Rohingyas who fled a brutal military crackdown in Myanmar five years ago. A police spokesman said security had been stepped up. BBC News. And the crowds there in the northern town of Makeni were chanting... We want peace, Mada must go, reference to the current president, Julius Mada Bio. So what is going on? Our correspondent in Freetown is Umaru Fofana. There are protests uh, in the east end of Freetown and in uh, many northern towns and cities, areas that are opposition strongholds. These people turned out and uh, they were chanting like you have there, saying that uh, they wanted peace and that murder must go. Mada Julius Mada Bio, the president of Sierra Leone. I mean, uh, I went to the east end of Freetown and I saw a lot of them, pockets of them in various areas, but quite a sizable number of them. And they set up roadblocks, burning tires, and the police responded. And uh, I also have seen videos on social media from areas in the north in McKinney, where large crowds also turned out there, and clearly they've been running amok with the police all day today. Are these videos verified, the ones you've been seeing? Yes, please, they are verified. They are verified pictures, and I've spoken to the police as well in McKinney, who initially described the situation as being tense, and then later on, the head of the police in the region, uh, Gebert Tommy, said that uh, I mean, people have been running amok, and according to him, attacking police officers, but then some civilian sources have also told me that police have been opening fire on civilians in various areas as they tried to ward off these um, protests. And has the government had anything at all to say about this? Yes, the government has. Um, a short while ago, I went to the office of the vice president, who incidentally is the acting president, President Bio, being out of the country at the moment. And I saw a lot of government officials, and they are having a special security meeting. I managed to pull aside the Minister of Information, Mohamed Rahman Swari, to get his reaction to today's developments. MACP has been invoked. So that's the military aid to civil power. The military aid to civil power has been invoked. Um, so you now see uh, visible presence of the army working um, conjointly with um, the operational support division of the police to restore law and order. Already, um, lives have been lost, including the lives of security personnel. Uh, police stations in various parts of the country have been touched. Um, government definitely condemns this in the strongest of terms. This is very, very important. Self-seeking politicians must be behind this. They are using unsuspecting young people. They are exploiting the joblessness situation of the young people. They are exploiting the global economic situation, which they, which they choose to localize at will. Do we know how many people have died so far? I can't put exact figures out now, but I'm aware that some civilians lost their lives here. Uh, police officers were killed here. People lost lives in Makeni. I understand the Kamakui police station was touched. And, uh, this is very, very sad. Is this not because of the way you responded to this? If only you had allowed people who wanted to protest peacefully, wouldn't this have been averted? Nobody approached um, the police for demonstrations. All you had were a group of self-seeking, faceless firebrands issuing out threats on social media. And in one instance, they did a letter to the police. According to the IGP of police, all efforts made to reach the telephone number proved futile. 
Isn't this because the last time they tried it, the last time there were people who formally asked for permission, they were turned down? They were not turned down. Um, they agreed with the police to postpone the demonstrations and they still went ahead with it. And that's Sierra Leone's Information Minister, Mohamed Rahman Suare. And he was blaming Umaru, um, what he called self-seeking uh, entities exploiting the economic difficulties of the country. But is there more to it than seems? Well, I think generally there has been, um, I mean, acute economic situation in Sierra Leone, which the government argues is occasioned by the situation in Ukraine as well as COVID before that situation. Uh, but joblessness here is really rife. Young people are without a job. And uh, I mean, prices of commodities keep going up. And then this has angered a lot of people. And he says that politicians are behind it. The main opposition or People's Congress Party has vehemently distanced themselves from it. A short while ago, I spoke to the Secretary General of the party, uh, Abdul Kagbo, who said that they condemned it and they had nothing to do with it. They believed in democracy and they wanted to return to power through the ballot box. So he says they have nothing to do with this. And Umaru, just explain something for me. So part of the chance was that we want peace, uh, madam must go. Peace from what? I mean, Sierra Leone is not currently in crisis, is it? Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, the opposition here have blamed the government um, persistently that the government had, um, you know, um, eroded on, I mean, their, 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 their rights and freedoms. And they said that uh, they, they've been referring to previous incidents, such as, um, you know, some incidents in McKinney in the northern capital, stronghold of the, of the, of the opposition, where some people were killed following a short disagreement over the, uh, some electricity situation. Every now and again, they've, occasion, they've started these instances saying that the country had been, uh, in their words, uh, very chaotic, very volatile on peace, I mean, uh, not peace and all of that. So that was a reference there. But generally, those that I spoke to on Kissy Road, where I went to and uh, I saw soldiers advancing and retreating, police advancing and retreating, they said they were tired, they wanted uh, jobs, and then they, they thought that uh, that would only come about if the current president left power. And that's our correspondent, Umaru Fufana, speaking to me from the Sierra Leonean capital, Freetown. In Kenya, votes are being counted as a new president is being chosen to succeed Uhuru Kenyatta. A former political prisoner and veteran opposition leader, Raila Odinga, is competing with Deputy President William Ruto. Polling day was largely peaceful, but turnout was low amid voter apathy and frustration over rising food, pri rising food prices. Well, uh, official results are not expected for several days, and Francis Wanderi is one of the commissioners from Kenya's electoral body, that's the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, or IEBC. And he says that there were a few instances where polling stations received voting materials late, but in the majority of cases, things had gone smoothly. Over 90% of materials got in time to their polling stations. However, we had hiccups in some areas like Kamega and Makwen where the voting, the machines did not work. We allowed those people to use the manual register to vote. And that was done a little late in the day, and we requested the officials to compensate for the time lost. Francis Wanderi of Kenya's Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. Well, our correspondent, Richard Kagwe, is in Nairobi and has been following the day's events. There's um, a lot of anxiety well, mixed with so much uh, anticipation just about um, the outcome of uh, the presidential election. So that's really the major talking point of uh, what people are you know, discussing amongst themselves uh, at the moment across the country, just monitoring offline and online. That's what people are talking about. And for those of us who are impatient as to the results, we'll have to wait to hear from the IEBC. Yes, so that takes about uh, seven days uh, from uh, the day polls are closed. Yeah, so the constitution dictates that um, the uh, electoral commission chairman can only announce uh, the final results after seven days because there's a process that goes into that uh, because just besides uh, the transmission of the results electronically, they also need to be verified by poll uh, representatives and uh, IBC officials at the National Tallying Center. That takes uh, you know, a bit of time, yeah. Indeed. And Richard, just walk me through the various stages of the election results process going forwards. What exactly happens when? OK, so um, <clears throat> immediately after we've had uh, the polls close and uh, the vote counting has happened, uh, we usually have um, the tabulation of the results. And uh, this is really contained in a document which is usually shared at the constituency level. And then we have the documents now scanned and then transmitted to the National Tallying Centre 
then we'd have the constituency returning officer uh, coming to the National Tallying Centre. That should probably be about uh, a day or two after the day of voting. And then the process of uh, individually verifi- uh, doing the verification, the validation uh, takes place. And that takes uh, roughly just about the same time uh, because the constituency t- returning officer has to come physically with a document for purposes of ratification. So roughly we're looking at about uh, two, three, four days uh, taking up uh, the process of a uh, transmission, counting, uh, verification uh, before we have uh, the announcement. And for the rest of the world, Richard, it's easy to forget that this isn't just presidential elections. You've got mayoral, you've got gubernatorial elections as well. Yeah, so basically we have uh, five other elective positions. Uh, that uh, Kenyans uh, did uh, vote for. So we're looking at uh, uh, the governor position, we're looking at a senator, a woman representative for the 47, uh, you know, devolved uh, units across the country. We have a member parliament and a ward representative who used to be referred to previously as a councillor. So it's 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 quite a very elaborate and involving process. So it's not just uh, the presidential election alone. And also take me through this labyrinth, if you like, of how the parliamentary system sits alongside the presidential system, because it is entirely possible in your system in Kenya to have a president of one party beholden to a parliament of another. Yeah, so that happens, especially when you have a scenario where we have... uh probably an opposition or a different party are commanding the majority in parliament. And so that was actually the case in Kenya when we had uh, the crisis in 2008, uh, where we'd have uh, a president uh, from a ruling party, but then the majority was the opposition. So more often is when we're seeing a sort of like collaboration that happens, uh, either in the form of a coalition talk that is done uh, post-election, just to figure out how the going to happen because you might be a president but you lack a majority so that means that uh, you know your legislative agenda would be frustrated to a certain extent so there have to be a sort of like common that's what happened in the UK when we had uh, the likes of Nick Clegg coming together uh, David Cameron and the rest Right and at what point does it begin to emerge in terms of finding a picture of how the election itself has ended up. Is there a sort of a tipping point? Are there sort of bellwether regions that we can look at and say if X party or Y party has won at a certain place that it's more likely then that they could form the next government? Yeah, so we're looking at uh, specifically um, regions where the you know main contenders basically their support be so that's a very key indication uh, to see how people did vote for specific candidates as well as you'd have regions that we consider to be like swing areas where they don't have a you know a presidential candidate but then they become you know regions that really determine how the election pans out so uh, probably this would be coming in as you're seeing uh, the provisional results are being announced or they're being made uh, you know uh, uh, published yeah so th- majorly you would see that you know possibly the support bases and regions which are considered to be swing votes so if you find one uh, really um, supporting or angling towards one candidate then that becomes uh, one of the major indicators And meanwhile, I mean, Kenyans have been very good at heeding the calls from soon-to-be ex-president Uhuru Kenyatta to vote quietly and go to their homes. Well, um, (laughs) well, 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 that would be the call, but um, it's very different because... uh, People, you know, I mean, they will not be there physically, you know, just at the polling station, but uh, they would be stuck across, you know, maybe just following the events as is happening in the news, as is being broadcasted. So virtually not so much has really happened. Uh, not so much, pro- you know, production has happened uh, since election day and even the day before. So because this is really very close to the hearts of many, many Kenyans. But what we saw is that uh, there was a very low uh, voter turnout. So far, the Electoral Commission indicates it to be about 64 percent. This is different compared to 2017, where we had about 80 percent, though we don't have the conclusive figures so far. But perhaps an indication that either Kenyans would be disenfranchised by the political class, uh, they feel that possibly the political elite are out of touch with the reality of challenges that do face ordinary Kenyans, and they feel that they're not in the best position to address issues that are of public interest. And that's the BBC's Richard Kagawe in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, to whom is owed many thanks indeed. Now, the military-led government in Guinea has issued a decree dissolving the country's 
uh, leading opposition movement, which it accuses of having or using violence during what it calls banned demonstrations. The National Front for the Defense of the Constitution, or FNDC, has called for nationwide demonstrations demonstrations next week at a time when some Guineans want the military to speed up the return to civilian rule. Well, we've not been able to get in touch with the government or the FNDC, but we have on the line an opposition party leader. He is Dr. Faya Lansana Milimuno, whose party, the Liberal Bloc, was once with the FNDC, but is now in favour of working with Ajanta. So, Dr. Milimuno, welcome to the programme. Um, just before I go into that uh, story, why did you choose to work with Ajanta? No, it, it's not like I did choose to work with the junta. Uh, what what uh, we have decided uh, in the Liberal Bloc is that this mess so, that is being cleaned by the junta was uh, made by politicians. It was because uh, somebody who has fought for 40 years as a politician come to power changed the constitution to stay. He created a crisis that led to the uh, uh, coup d'etat. Mm. Actually, from our understanding, everybody should be around the table to contribute and get this country to come back to the normal life. And so it's your view, obviously, that um, the government reneged on what it said it was going to do. And you think that is the reason to support them. But I just wonder, what is your stance on the junta's clampdown on the FNDC, your former allies? I mean, uh, from my understanding, it is the law in this country uh, that uh, an association uh, can be... um, dismantled uh, because the authority consider that uh, the, the, the association is uh, creating uh, a problem in the country that cannot allow the peace to be built. So that is the law. Now. But my view about it is they should don't uh, dismantle uh, 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 FNDC. Uh, just because uh, they have a call for demonstration. Even though we know in our country here in Guinea, uh, every time we talk about demonstrations, we count dead people. At one point, we have to sit down and think deeply about it. We are, we are fighting. Right. It is to govern human beings. It's not to govern dead bodies. Right. So, so let's just be clear here. Is this something you condemn or is this something you applaud that the junta has clamped down on the FNDC? I mean, uh, it's something that I, that I condemn. But uh, as far as the demonstrations that have been called by uh, FNDC, I, I, don't, I don't consider them as to be uh, uh, relevant at this time uh, because it doesn't, it won't allow us to speed up this transition and come back to the normal. Mm. Look, it has been more than four months. We are trying to define what uh, dialogue means, what uh, consultation means. How long is that that's going to last for us to sit down around the table and, and uh, share views about how to come back to the normal life in our country? Right. So, I mean, Dr. Milimunu, this is an almost an exegesis, a defense of your position, but many in the FNDC would call you a sellout. How do you respond to that? (laughs) It's a view of... But... uh, Ah. Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. So I have value... uh, uh, we having clearly we're having problems with the line, Doctor Milimunu. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, go ahead then, please. So what I'm saying is, uh, it is the point of view. Uh, I don't consider myself uh, uh, like what they're saying. I am making a point here for peace, for this transitional period to be speed up, 
And uh, now, those people who are uh, criticizing the junta as to say that mm. the junta don't, doesn't want to speed up uh, uh, the process, they are the one to be the cause of the problem. Right. Because it so, has been five months. Five months. Yep. We are trying to get together to talk.